Welcome and thank you for watching the Street Transportation Department's virtual pre-recorded presentation about the West Phoenix Transportation Study. The purpose of this project is to provide guidance on future street, zoning, and policy needs that will help create responsible land use, safe streets, and vibrant neighborhoods in West Phoenix. Next slide, please. Si les gustaría escuchar esta junta en español, sigan las instrucciones en su pantalla. Primero, vayan a la barrita de este video donde encontrarán una CC y un círculo de herramienta localizada en la esquina a la derecha. Luego, seleccione la CC para aprender los subtítulos. Luego, seleccione el círculo de herramienta. Esto le abrirá una ventana con opciones. Next slide, please. Ahora, seleccione la palabra Auto Translate. Le saldrá una lista de idiomas. Aquí seleccione su idioma preferido, seleccione el español, que es Spanish. Y ahora ya se cambió los subtítulos para tener en español y poder escuchar esta junta en su idioma preferido. Next slide, please. I am Padilla, and I am a Public Information Officer with the City of Phoenix Street Transportation Department, and I am your host for today's virtual pre-recorded presentation. On your screen, you will see a list of some of the key members with our department who are leading this project. And now you will hear from Kenny Knudsen, our Street Transportation Department Director. Hello, and I want to thank you all for participating in this process and, and viewing this uh, meeting. Uh, we are here to talk about our West Phoenix Transportation Study and where we're at right now to provide an update. Uh, this is the purpose of this study is to be able to look at how this area of Phoenix is growing, uh, both with new developments and as redevelopment occurs, and at what the impacts those have on our transportation patterns within this West Phoenix boundaries. We want to make sure that we're looking ahead to what is expected from a growth perspective and a capacity perspective for our roadways. And we want to share that with you, but we also want to hear from you. So as our team talks about this West Transportation Study, we want to hear back and have feedback from you about what you feel about the study, what do you think is important to you, what considerations do we need to incorporate as we continue on with this study. So thank you very much again for being here, and uh, we appreciate your input. And, uh, and, and engagement in this process. On your screen, you'll see an agenda for today's presentation. We'll start with a project overview, followed by an in-depth review of current conditions, and then we'll introduce the opportunities for public feedback, which is incredibly important for us for the success of this project. And we'll also talk about the next steps. And with that, Brian Fellows, your project manager, will take it away. Thanks, Vivian, and thanks everyone for, for viewing this. Um, like Vivian said, I'm Brian Fellows. I'm a principal planner here at the Street Transportation Department and the project manager for this study. This is a really important study, uh, very timely because this area is gonna experience a lot of growth. There's a lot of undeveloped land, um, more population and more um, uh, development to come. And we want to make sure we get out ahead of this and this study will provide us with guidance on how to uh, keep and improve the connections that people will need um, that are using active transportation, people who are walking, biking, uh, driving wheelchairs, uh, driving scooters, and just wanna make sure that we have a safe network for those active transportation users. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Justin Feek, our uh, uh, project manager from Michael Baker International to uh, take the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, like, this, like Brian said, this is a very important effort uh, due to the rapidly growing West Phoenix area. I'll start out with a project overview and then get into more of the details of our current conditions report. So to go through the project process, uh, we started out with, there's, there's six main tasks in the project. This whole overall process started in fall of 2020, 2022 and is, is scheduled to extend to fall 2023. As you can see here, there are six primary tasks within the study, and we are currently rounding out task three, which is the current conditions report. After completion of the current conditions report, we'll move into future conditions where we look at um, the, the future transportation system out to plan horizon year 2040 and get an idea of what changes will occur with regards to land use and demands on the transportation system. After that, we will develop our evaluation criteria to uh, prioritize our recommended improvements. And then as you can see here, we will come back to the, the public one more time in a virtual public meeting fashion similar to this 
to get feedback on the, um, the project recommendations and the infrastructure improvements. And then we'll close out the project roughly uh, November of this year, 2023. Getting into the study purpose and need in a little more detail. So this is a multimodal study. We are looking at all modes, um, as Brian mentioned. Um, we're aligning future land use and roadway infrastructure systems with active transportation needs. To Brian's point earlier, there are several planned developments within this area that are, are coming online very rapidly. And we've been coordinating with planning and development at the city of Phoenix to learn more about those overall um, developments, which in some cases are going to generate a lot of additional trips within the study area with regards to all modes. So we wanna be cogniz cognizant of that. Um, another unique aspect of this plan is that the study area is bounded by Glendale, Avondale, and Tolleson. So we wanna make sure that we are coordinating improvements with our, our neighbors on all sides. And then finally, the, the overall deliverable of this plan is a, a, the identification of projects for inclusion in the Street Transportation Department Capital Improvement Program and to get those projects funded and constructed to actually improve the transportation system in the short, mid, and long range timeframes. So now we're going to dive into some of the, the findings of our current conditions report. So to orient the participants in this meeting to our study area is in far west Phoenix as the study name um, indicates. And it is in, on the far end of Maryvale, as I mentioned, the Maryvale Village. As I mentioned, the study area is bounded by Glendale to the north and northeast, Avondale to the south and southwest, and Tolleson to the south. So it's important to um, collaborate with our, our, our partner agencies on all sides, like I mentioned. Perimeter roadways are owned by those jurisdictions, so it's all that much more important to make sure that they're aware of what we're doing and that we're coordinating improvements to align with their existing and future transportation systems. And uh, another key aspect of the planning study area is that it is an urban rural interface in the sense that there are several areas in the north and northwest of the study area that are already built out, but then there's also large swaths of developable land that are developing rapidly, mainly along the 101 in a mixed use and commercial fashion also with some um, single family residential, some, so diverse land use mix there. And as a high level overview, the land area is 6.5 square miles. Getting into the local context of the study area, this map shows in a little more detail or at a, at a, at a more detailed scale, our study area and, and it's bound, being bounded by surrounding jurisdictions. Um, there are a lot of traffic generators that you may be familiar with within the study area that are going to generate future trips and also generate trips currently. Some of those being um, the State Farm Stadium that is just outside of our study area, we're cognizant of that. The Camelback Ranch Ballpark um, for spring training and, and, and baseball events in the spring and throughout the year. We have Banner Australia Medical Center, which generates a lot of trips from the larger region and within the study area. And then finally, there are a few major activity centers um, in or adjacent to the study area, including Gateway Pavilion Shopping Center, um, which generates quite a few trips. Um, some other unique things that we're considering as we develop and identify, identify and develop um, solutions for the transportation system. There are a lot of canals within the area that present opportunities for connectivity by bike and ped loads. Um, the, the planning study area is bisected by the 101 which creates great connectivity via vehicle, but it does create some challenges for east-west connectivity for bikes and peds. And then finally, it's as we've mentioned a few times, it really is important for us to get, keep an eye on the planned development in the area because the area is developing rapidly and there will be a lot of resultant um, trips via all modes that we need to make sure the um, transportation system is keeping up with. So just to get into kind of the, the nuts and bolts of how we, we started out the study, so as you can see here on my screen, there are several studies, um, policy and project documents have been, have been completed by the City of Phoenix, um, surrounding agencies and the Maricopa Association of Governments that um, give us ideas with regards to policies and projects that should be included or considered in our plan. And then you'll also see here that there are several plan use developments and traffic impact statements that we are taking into consideration. So ultimately we have taken a look at all these studies and we are assessing them to, to, to help drive the transportation solutions that we're going to identify in our future conditions report. 
getting into the plan developments a little bit more. Um, working with planning and development at the city of Phoenix, we have identified seven plan developments. As you can see on the screen, they're, they're, they're pretty large in size and most of them straddle um, loop 101 and are and within the, the north and eastern portion of our planning area. These uh, new developments combined um, add up to over 1,400 acres of new office retail and mixed use development. So the approximately 8,500 new multifamily and high density homes. And then, and then finally, um, there have been traffic impact assessments and statements completed for a couple of these developments already. There are different phases of in the development process, but as of today, we've identified at least, if not more than 25,000 additional weekday trips um, within the study area, which is going to drive our future of conditions recommendations and and project our project implementation plan. Getting into the, the land use a little bit more of the study area, as I mentioned, it, it is kind of a, a unique area in the sense that you have a lot of different land uses represented. Um, as you can see here, single family residential is the highest percentage of the overall study area land use. There's quite a bit of agriculture there at 20.17%, which within the next 10 years on that previous slide is slated for development. So we need to be cognizant of that and make sure that we're developing a transportation system to accommodate growth. And then there's also um, some, just a few other highlights. We have multifamily residential, which will be increasing quite a bit in the next 10 years and also commercial. So in general, you're, we're going to see a shift from single family residential land uses to more of a mixed use um, retail and commercial use of land in conjunction with those, those, those mixed use high density and sometimes single family unit um, residential um, developments. And, and this all makes it important for us to, to make sure that we're considering the context of development so that we create a place that, that's pleasant to live in and that people can move around in efficiently and safely. Getting into the, the study area profile sub areas. So um, to my point of there being multiple different character areas and different land uses, to help make sense of our study area, we did, we did divide the overall um, area into three um, three primary sub areas. One of those being the Camelback Ranch Villa Depaz area that is primarily in the northwest and, and is made up of uh, already developed areas that were built um, several decades ago. And then you have the the Camelback Ranch ballpark there, which generates a lot of trips both internal to the study area and the region. We have the Banner Medical established neighborhoods, which surround the Banner Australia Medical Center which is a, is a major employment um, center within the study area and generates a lot of trips. And then finally, we have a third sub area, sub area, which is along the 101, and that has its own unique characteristics in the sense that those planned use developments are going to partake, um, take place there for the most part. So that's probably where we're going to see the most robust growth within the study area, and we need to be cognizant of that. Then place types, um, there are several different types of, of traffic generators. We have residential neighborhoods, neighborhood centers, regional centers, and vacant open space. And it was important to characterize these because they all have to develop, um, generate varying levels of trips that we need to accommodate in the future. Getting into the, the zoning a little bit more, this is kind of an attack on to um, the land use slide that I presented previously. So single family residential is currently the the most abundant zoning within the study area. That's going to be changing over time, as I mentioned. Planned area developments are still, a, a, today, a relatively robust part of the land use portfolio or zoning portfolio, but we anticipate that number to increase quite a bit. Multifamily residential will, will likely become a higher percentage of the overall mix. And um, the overall gist of this is that, you know, Today, this is mainly a kind of a bedroom community that's rapidly developing with some, some regional traffic generators. But the overall message that we're trying to paint here or are, are, are show is that it is going to become more of a destination um, with all the, the development along the 101 and those planned use developments that we have on our radar. So all things that we need to consider as we move forward in this study. Getting into the employers a little bit, this is important to look at because it helps our study team identify where folks are trying to get to and from during the AM and PM peak hours, as we call it in the transportation planning world. Um, as I mentioned before, there is a, a character area for Banner Health 
Banner Health is the is the largest employer in the area and is only projected to grow. So we need to make sure that we can get folks efficiently and safely to and from the vicinity of Thomas Road and the 101. And then there's a smattering of other um, relatively large kind of mid-sized employers throughout the study area that that we've mapped and we wanna make sure that folks can get to throughout the day and, and with a primary focus at rush hour um, on in the morning and in the evening as well. Uh, getting into the, the current population, so the latest census data or population data available was from 2020. Um, and this slide is, is basically depicting that the, the majority of the built out areas of the study area are just north of Indian School Road there between Indian School and Camelback and west of 99th Avenue. Those are mainly neighborhoods that have been built out for several decades, but there is still room for improvement. With regards to with regards to signalization and circulation, um, and making sure that bike ped modes are represented, um, and then as you can see to the east of the 101, the 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 census tracts are a little bit, or the traffic analysis zones are a little bit less populated. They range from about 331 individuals in a zone to over. 2,000 or 3,000 down by Banner Australia, but the overall message is that um, this area is going to be um, developing rapidly, and those population areas that are are rel relatively minimal, or there's a, a low population now, that'll likely change very quickly in, in the future, and we need to make sure that we're accommodating those needs moving forward. Um, getting into roadway ownership, as I mentioned previously, it is important to coordinate with our partner agencies, I call them Glendale, Avondale, and Tolleson. As you can see on the map, there are several segments of roadway. I'll highlight a few, Indian School Road, um, west of 99th Avenue and Camelback Road, east of 99th Avenue that are owned by neighboring jurisdictions. We also have 99th Avenue between Thomas Road and McDowell that is owned by Maricopa County. And this is important in the sense that at the beginning of the project, I mentioned that we will be identifying improvements for inclusion in the Street Transportation Department CIP, but we also will be identifying candidate improvements to the transportation system for all modes in those surrounding jurisdictions CIPs as well. So that, that basically makes it important for us to make sure that those surrounding jurisdictions know what we're doing and, and that we're well coordinated in our efforts to create a world-class transportation system. Getting into traffic signals a little bit, there are 21 City of Phoenix owned and operated signals um, within our study area. We will be looking at these signals for improvements, including um, improvements to the signals themselves, like left turn arrows, um, additional signal heads over all travel lanes, things of that nature. Um, just really making sure that if there are signals warranted where they don't exist today, that we are proposing those because I think we all know that along busy roads, it could be a lot of danger presented if you have folks making left turns across wide roadways. So we wanna make sure um, not only are the existing signals um, in it, up to date and effect working to the, the greatest degree possible, but we wanna identify locations for additional signals. And then finally, um, there is one high intensity activated crosswalk within the study area, but we will be looking at the opportunity to recommend and install additional um, mid-block crossings or hawks as they're coined here. And, and I should point out that there are several um, schools within, within the study area, and those will probably be candidate locations that we look at first and foremost for hawks um, and mid-block crossings in the vicinity of those schools, but then we'll also look at locations where there are long distances between signalized intersections for folks to cross to hopefully make the, the walking and biking experience safer. Getting into the um, traffic analysis a little bit more. Um, so as part of this study, we did take um, counts, traffic counts at nine new locations. And then we also married our nine new locations data to a robust data set from the Maricopa Association of Governments. Um, as you can see on this map, uh, there are some pretty high traffic volumes, mainly on the arterials within the study area. Um, they range from, you know, average daily trips range from about 50,000 a day all the way down to about 20,000 a day and that, or 15,000 a day, excuse me. And that this really gives us an idea of where the trips are being made today and where we should focus improvements. 
Um, in the future conditions report, we will actually be doing projections for the year 2040, and that'll give us an idea of the delta between today and that planning horizon. And that'll help us identify a prioritized list of roadway improvements um, to make sure that the roads have capacity needed to accommodate that future growth we've been talking about throughout this presentation. Getting into vehicular level of service. So level of service in the transportation planning world is a very strong barometer of whether or not folks are sitting in traffic at a acceptable level. I, obviously less congestion is, is um, usually desirable, but there's also a safety component of that. Um, but to back that out to a higher level, the existing or the acceptable level of service within the city of Phoenix at both intersections and at mid block segments is a level of service D. And as you can see on this map, every segment of roadway is within that level of service D threshold or better as of today, I should say. So um, really there, there's not a per se, uh, a, a congestion issue. There is a congestion issue, but when we marry that, this data with the future data will really get a better picture with regards to where we should be recommending roadway widening and capacity improvements, including turn lanes, et cetera. And, and, and that'll allow us to not only pinpoint the projects, but prioritize them so that they are in lockstep with the timing of development and growth within the study area itself. And that is, as you may be able to see here, currently there's only one segment of roadway that is at a level of service D or, or worse and are failing. It's just the transportation planning term, and that's around the vicinity of 99th Avenue and Cam Camelback. So to bring my point home, if we were to propose projects today, we would mainly focus on that Camelback Road and 99th Avenue intersection first, and then focus on those level of service C areas after that. But then when we look at future conditions and future congestion, that'll help us get a picture of the future um, needs, and then we can prioritize and identify those projects accordingly. We do expect uh, congestion to, to ramp up and increase quite a bit in this area. So it will be an interesting and important evaluation. Getting into traffic analysis, level of traffic stress. So this is another way to look at congestion and also um, the comfort levels that bicyclists and pedestrians experience throughout the study area. As you can see here, there's four different um, increments or thresholds of bicycle comfort that are geared towards varying levels of bicycle um, expertise and, and comfort. So a LTS score of one is, is, is kind of your target goal um, where you're not excluding any folks of, of any ages or abilities from using biking and walking. As you can see, most of our LTS score, um, there aren't a lot of LTS score one locations, but some of the better scoring LTS two um, locations are within neighborhoods and along collector roads, as we call them, they're in yellow. So those, those corridors are doing pretty well, but we still want to look for improvements. But then, as you can see on the map, there's quite a few segments that are level of tra um, traffic stress score three and four. And these are really locations at mid block and intersections where we want to hone in on creating a safer and more comfortable environment for um, biking and walking of all and, and um, users of all abilities. So essentially this map is helping us pinpoint where we need to focus our bike pet improvements first and then and then work our way down and do our prioritization to those longer term improvements. Getting into the, the bikeways and multimodal paths. Um, so as you can see here, this is a little bit different flavor map, but um, we did include the, the bikes and multimodal paths in neighboring jurisdictions. And the overarching theme throughout this study has been connecting to our partner agency transportation systems. As you can see here, a lot of the, the bike and multimodal paths within the city of Phoenix do already connect to facilities in Avondale in particular, but we will be looking for opportunities in the future to connect to our, our neighboring partner jurisdictions even better. Um, and then this area is, as I mentioned before, blessed with um, quite a few canals, which uh, which can be used for connectivity. We'll be looking into that as well. And then I finally should mention that um, the 101 does present, as you can see here, there's not a lot of bike facilities that cross the 101 from east to west. But one thing we will be doing in coordination with planning and development is looking for opportunities to provide improved or increased bicycle and pedestrian connectivity across the 101 
via um, overpasses or underpasses that may be recommendations of this study as well. Getting into um, the pedestrian infrastructure, as you can see here, there's a, a pretty robust um, set of, of local street sidewalks um, within the study area, which is obviously a good thing. There are some areas that there, where there's room for improvement, where there's only by, uh, sidewalks on one side of the roadway. So we have pinpointed those and we will be assessing the need to have a, a sidewalk on each side of the roadway. Um, I should also mention that, like I mentioned before, there's there's several schools within the study area. We will be focusing on the vicinity of those schools in quite a bit of detail to make sure that children and, and folks of all abilities can walk and bike to and from school and into those neighborhoods. That'll be a major part of it. And, and, and then finally, um, like I mentioned, there, there currently isn't great connectivity across the 101. So through the same light or beam of, as I talked about with regards to the, the bicycle facilities across the 101, we're gonna look for opportunities to provide additional sidewalks or crossing of the 101 for people on foot. Getting into some of the, the pedestrian and bicycle volumes. So this is a snapshot of, this is a attack on to the, the nine locations where we did traffic counts. As you can see here on the, in the left-hand column there under intersection, there's several nine um, intersections where we did 24 hour pedestrian counts. And we also did bicycle counts. Um, as can be seen, there were 943 total folks um, walking within a 24 hour period in February within the study area. And there were also 112 bicycles in February, um, bicycling within the study area. With, uh, so that gives us an indication of how many bikes and peds there are out there today. But then an additional takeaway from this overall presentation or this table, I should say, is that it helps us pinpoint locations where there's already existing pedestrian and bicycle demand. So just as an example, if you were to glance at this table, you can see that 99th Avenue and Camelback Avenue Campbell Avenue, I should say, sorry, um, is a major hub of pedestrian activity. And that's not a surprise to most folks that live in the study area because the Legend School is there. So we really wanna focus on pedestrian improvements in the vicinity of 99th Avenue and Campbell. Same can be said for 111th Avenue and Indian School. Um, there's a relatively high number of, of pedestrians there. So we wanna focus on pedestrian improvements there as well. And then finally, there, there's a smattering of between 25 and one bicycle trips throughout all these different um, intersections for a total of 112. So basically we would start with the highest ranking or the, the, the intersection with the most bicycles and, and focus there for bicycle improvements, but then also expand outward to make sure that we're covering the whole area. So this is just a really great barometer of, of how the overall bike and pad activity out there today and gives us a lot of enlightenment enlightenment with regards to where we should be focusing to identify projects for prioritization in the future. Um, tra transit system network, there is a decent amount of transit connectivity um, to the study area. As can be seen on the slide, there's four fixed routes, routes 17, 29, 41, and 50. Um, they mainly run along the major east-west arterials of Camelback Road, Indian School Road, and, and McDowell today, and also Thomas, I should say. Um, there are 40 bus stops within the study area with varying levels of amenities. We have um, inventory those amenities and wanna make sure that the amenities are up to, um, at, a, at an acceptable level. By amenities, I mean benches, shade, trash receptacles, et cetera. So those could be recommendations for improvement at some of our higher ridership bus stops. And then the top six um, bus stops with regards to ridership, boarding and alightings are between 14 and 21 per day, which is not an overly robust number, but we do believe that we can get that number to be higher if we provide good connectivity to biking and walking facilities so people can um, basically um, get, get in their first and last mile trips to connect to transit and get to home businesses and places where they, they need to get to throughout the day in the study area. Uh, our safety analysis here, um, this is another set of data that really helps us hone in on where there's there's trouble spots or our crash hot spots. As you can see on the map, unfortunately, there are quite a few crashes of varying severity. 
within the study area, there are several fatal collisions, which I, I, I hate to um, point out, but they're there and we need to be cognizant of them so we can design um, um, safety improvements in our future conditions report and as part of the study. And then, as you can see here, uh, with all the varying degrees of se severity with regards to crashes, some of the spots that, that, that stick out are Camelback Road from 107th Avenue to 91st Avenue, Indian School Road from 99th Avenue to 91st Avenue, Thomas Road from 99th Avenue to 91st Avenue, and 91st Avenue from Camelback Road to McDowell Road. So essentially our efforts moving forward, will be focusing our near-term improvements on these areas, but then expanding outward to make sure that we're, we're at least considering safety improvements anywhere and everywhere that there's been crash hot spots um, based on our data that you can see here. Uh, getting into bike ped crashes, that, that previous slide, I didn't mention it, it was based on vehicles. This slide is, uh, is a little bit, is more focused on bike ped crashes. Unfortunately, as we saw on a previous slide, the level of traffic stress is relatively high on many of the arterials within the study area. And I think this data does kind of help hammer that home to a certain extent. Unfortunately, we do have, um, a decent number of crashes within the study area for bikes and peds. As you can see, there were a couple fatal crashes, unfortunately, along Camelback Road. And then there's a smattering of, of bicycle crashes along the uh, bike ped crashes along the arterials being Camelback, Indian School, and also Thomas Road. So it's the same theme here where we really want to go out and look at, or we're going out and looking at the locations where these crashes have occurred thinking about what may have led to a crash and then coming up with practical and implementable solutions to help mitigate um, crashes of all severity in the future. Getting into the, the safety data a little bit more, um, this is a different way that transportation planners look at, um, at crashes and it helps us identify candidate improvements. As you can see here, there, there's a little bit of a success story, although it's not something um, to really tout because we really want to try to get to zero crashes in the end, especially fatal crashes. But as you can see here, in general, the trend between 2017 and 2021 has been one of a, a slight jump or a relatively modest jump between 2017 and 2018. But then the good news is, is that there was a little bit of a downward trend in crashes overall between 2018 and 2021. Um, but if we move our attention over to the pie chart here, um, there are there are a series of crashes by type, and what this does is it allows us to identify um, the manner in which crashes are occurring, and then we can we can develop um, improvement recommend recommendations accordingly to help hopefully mitigate that type of crash. So, for example, um, there are quite a few rear end crashes within the study area. Um, there's things we can do to to help mitigate that. Um, some of that is reducing speed, making sure people are, you know, stopping in time at, at intersections. You have your, um, your your left turn crashes, which which indicates, for example, there may be a need for new signals or, or left turn arrows at intersections, things like that. Um, we got head on crashes, which which tells us that medians and things of that nature may be beneficial. So essentially. Um, this pie chart, we'll, we'll, we'll be diving into this quite a bit more and trying to identify, we'll be marrying this to the previous slide where the crash locations were noted and coming up with um, uh, safety projects to mitigate all these different types of crashes by location um, through the short, mid and long range timeframe as, as part of this project. Uh, with that, that concludes the overall um, summary of our current conditions report. Now I'm going to get into the next steps for the project. So um, once again, thank you all for participating today. Um, and, and really what I'm going to focus on here is that, as I mentioned at the outside, outset of the presentation, um, this is about a year long process. We just finished the current conditions report. And there, I should note, and as you can see on this slide, there will be a couple more opportunities for public and stakeholder participation. Um, as you can see on this slide, if you can see it, there is going to be another opportunity for, um, for public participation, participation via a public hearing or a virtual meeting similar to this in the roughly August to early September timeframe. And then we'll also be doing a Maryville Village Planning Committee 
um, presentation prior to that public hearing, virtual public hearing in August, the August timeframe um, to get the word out with regards to our actual improvement recommendations and the prioritization of those improvements. Um, and just to get into a little more granular level of detail, this is more of a, a 90 day look ahead, as I like to call it. Um, our, our next push is really going to be focused on the future conditions report that I've been mentioning throughout. That's where we're going to be looking at congestion um, and the impacts of growth all the way through 2040. And then after that, we'll be coming up with a plan of improvements that will be vetted at that public meeting in the late summer timeframe. And then we'll, we'll round out the project um, around the 1st of November or in fall of this year. Um, so with that, I will, um, I guess one more slide here, just some key contacts. So we do have Brian Fellows on the call. He's our city of Phoenix project manager. I'm Justin Feek from Michael Baker. And then I should mention that there, if you have any comments or feedback for the team here after the meeting today, there is a project hotline noted there that you can call and leave comments or feedback. We have a project email that's being, um, being monitored by our, our public involvement consultant. So you can, spend, you can send email comments to the email noted there. For additional information, including um, working paper number one, which has been the subject of this presentation, the current conditions, um, working paper and this presentation will be posted to the project webpage at the web link provided there on the bottom left corner of the page. And then finally, I should mention that there will be a live electronic survey that's going live on April 17th, and it'll be open through May 17th of 2023 of this year. So please feel free to utilize any of these methods or venues um, to, to provide feedback. We really do want to get feedback with regards to not only the projects that we should be recommending, but the prioritization of those improvements. And then ultimately, we hope to get those projects in the, the CIP for the street transportation department and surrounding jurisdictions, and ultimately improve the transportation system for all users. Thank you for your time today. And with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Brian, if you have any additional remarks. No, thank you so much for your time and attention on that, Justin. It's going to be a really good final uh, report. We look forward to uh, reporting on that. Uh, thank you all again for attending, and uh, I'll turn it back over to Vivian. And that's all. Just as a friendly reminder, that project webpage is phoenix.gov forward slash streets forward slash WPTS. And we look forward to seeing your survey results. Go ahead and contact that project hotline or email address if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Thank you.